Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we are looking at James Joyce's novel Ulysses. So this particular lecture will be the concluding lecture on Ulysses where I talk about the various aspects which we have covered already and also uh, the final section of the novel which is about Molly Bloom's soliloquy, the huge um, you know, section which has like 8 sentences and almost like more than uh, almost 100, uh, 100 pages uh, and in terms of looking at the final stream of consciousness with which Ulysses' the novel ends. And I'm going to talk about that in some respect. We will not look at it specifically, we will talk about the stylistic features that Joyce uses while describing Molly Bloom's uh, final soliloquy and situate that in relation to the other uh, streams of consciousness which we see in the novel. Uh, and what we see immediately when you take a look at that soliloquy by Molly Bloom, this is about her reminiscing about her experiences of uh, childhood in, in Gibraltar where she grew up, uh, where she was a daughter of uh, you know, she had come from mixed parentage, so she's the daughter of an Irish uh, military person and a local woman uh, of Spanish origin. Uh, so she has an Andalusian quality to it as well. Uh, and then, you know, she, her childhood was in Gibraltar, which is obviously again a very symbolic setting because that situates uh, in very close proximity to the seafaring quality uh, about the, you know, the original myth, the original epic, which is Ulysses, uh, you know, Odysseus by Homer where you know, obviously she is the counterpart of uh, Penelope over here with the very interesting uh, difference of being and you know, Penelope was the quote unquote faithful wife uh, to Odysseus when he came back from years of traveling on the seas whereas we see Molly Bloom has already had an affair and is in, in an affair with someone called Hugh Boylan uh, who happens to work in the same place as a manager of this opera company where she works in in Dublin. So you know that, that the idea of having an affair outside of a marriage uh, gives a, a very interesting location in terms of the original uh, character uh, of which she is presumably based, uh, that of Penelope in Homer's Odysseus. Now the setting of Gibraltar, I've already mentioned this once in one of my previous lectures in Ulysses, the setting of Gibraltar is interesting because that situates the novel's seafaring quality more uh, prominently uh, and more uh, so visually speaking as well because uh, Gibraltar being this very important uh, seafaring point in terms of old voyages. Now, if you take a look at the final uh, soliloquy in Molly Bloom, which is this long, uh, huge uh, section which comprises eight sentences as I just mentioned and just uh, a very few punctuations, the final bit, uh, the final punctuation bit, the, the yes what she says in the end. Um, now if you compare that with the, uh, some of the characters in the novel and we just saw uh, just before this in the previous lecture we saw the conversation between, uh, this dialogue as it were between uh, Stephen de Dallas and uh, Leopold Bloom, we find that the, uh, the, the male characters in the novel are often, they just speak in dialogues which are very dry, which are very, very over intellectualized, which is to say that takes away uh, a large part of the attention from the reality of life. So there's this long discourse about art and aesthetics and politics and literature and painting. Uh, about the crisis in Dublin and about Ireland in general and that just goes on in very dry dialogues which has got nothing uh, in terms of its relation to reality. Whereas Molly Blue's uh, final soliloquy uh, is obviously very, very different. It's more uh, visual, it's also more visceral, it's more experiential, it's more embodied and it actually foregrounds the body, it foregrounds the sentient body, the sexualized female body and it sort of celebrates it. There are lots of allusions to sexuality but also other kinds of bodily behavior which are uh, prominently foregrounded throughout the entire soliloquy. And what that foregrounding does, obviously, it does a very political thing. It foregrounds the female body, the female desire, the female gaze, the female subject uh, as someone who has a last voice, the last speaking voice in a novel. Quite literally, the novel ends with Molly Bloom's soliloquy. So the closing of the novel and the closing of Molly Bloom's soliloquy are synchronous events. But equally, uh, it actually tells us that the entire uh, idea of Ulysses, the entire experience of Ulysses, the novel reading experience of Ulysses is to be located in the, in the, in the visceral, in the embodied, in the corporeal quality which it celebrates uh, by foregrounding the same. Right? So the, we have this idea of intellectualization which is the skills that Stephen D. Dallas has with many of his um, you know, colleagues in the university, many of his arty friends in, in Dublin 
which is quite dry as to scare as, as far as to scores go. And then we have Molly Bloom's um, very amazing solo loki, which is very moving, very fluid, and that becomes part of the uh, uh, shift, part of the linguistic shift in the novel. Now, the fluidity of Molly Bloom's uh, solo loquy is obviously a very experiential in quality. It's about the entire experience of sexuality, the entire experience of pleasure, the entire experience of memory, the entire experience of childhood, and how that is all remembered uh, in different degrees of remembrance, and how the solo loquy becomes, in, in a way, uh, a large narrative of memory, a large narrative of remembrance. When she remembers uh, her first kiss, her remembers her first proposing, how uh, Lupa Bloom had proposed her. Uh, and also, uh, she keeps talking about uh, Hugh, Hugh Boydlin in, in very interesting ways, you know, the, the person that she's not having an affair with at this present moment of time. So, what the last solo loquery does, among other things, it also brings in different orders of temporality and very interesting tension with each other. Right? So, we have this all idyllic childhood temporality in, in Gibraltar, uh, which is where she was growing up, this very Andalusian quality, Spanish quality about her childhood, uh, her being from mixed parentage, and also this very exotic, this extensive and expansive landscape of Gibraltar, which is contrasted with the very dry and claustrophobic uh, quality of Dublin. A city with, with blocks, a city which blocks the vision, the city which uh, sort of represses her uh, sexually, spiritually, existentially, and emotionally, right? And the only uh, the only liberation that she gets uh, over here is uh, from being an opera singer, right? Now, obviously, as you know, the Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom they had two children. So one is Millie Bloom, the daughter who's studying photography now. But more interestingly, they also had a son called Rudy Bloom, uh, who died at the age of eleven. So I've already seen uh, we discussed in some details how uh, Stephen Dallas can be seen as uh, the, the, the proxy son uh, of uh, uh, Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom, the son they never had. Uh, and obviously, uh, the parentless quality of Stephen Dallas actually accentuates his reading. The fact that, you know, her parents, his parents were absent, uh, conspicuously absent, uh, in a lens of substance and this reading of him being the proxy son, the spiritual son, as it were, uh, to Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom. So, the, the entire kinship quality in the novel is interesting because on the one hand we have these different kinds of kinship systems which are established. On the other hand, the kinship is also established through narratives. How narratives crisscross each other. Uh, there is a Bloomed narrative which is extending in one direction, there is uh, uh, the Dallas narrative which is extending in another direction and how they crisscross each other in different interesting intersections. And as interesting intersections they generate qualities of kinship in the novel. So, there is a very interesting relationship to be had between kinship and narrative, between storytelling and being situated in someone's story. So, if you are inside someone's story, that gives you a sense of kinship with that other person, with that particular narrative. So, narrativity and kinship are very interestingly entangled with each other in this particular novel. Now, just coming back to the final bit uh, about uh, Molly Bloom's, uh, you know, uh, very, very interestingly uh, embodied and corporeal uh, last epiphany, a last stream of consciousness, where she talks about the final bit obviously is being uh, her saying yes to the proposal of marriage uh, by Leopold Bloom. Uh, and obviously, th some biographers of Joyce would say that you know, Molly Bloom was loosely based on Nora, uh, Joyce's wife. Uh, but uh, in, in, not to get too detailed in such biographical readings, it is still possible to find out how the entire voice given to the woman at the end of uh, uh, Ulysses is something which obviously makes it quite radical in quality given us that particular setting of time. But also, equally interesting is to see how the linguistic registers changes completely. So, the language becomes, as I mentioned, more fluid, more promiscuous, uh, more mixed, uh, more heterogeneous, uh, more heteroglossic, and obviously it cuts across different points of time, uh, and it completely becomes anti-intellectual, it completely becomes anti-rational. So, the anti-rationality, the anti-intellectual quality uh, with the last sort of loquy of Ulysses, which is what gives us magnificently promiscuous quality, uh, which is about the real promiscuity of Molly Bloom as well, but how the promiscuity is represented in the language. So, language becomes uh, a very, very um, uh, sort of centerless and a centerless quality of the language is obviously reflected uh, in the lack of punctuation and, and, and it is reflected in the literally the stream like quality in the, in, the, in the language. How it just goes on from one direction to another direction. Uh, it has a series of digressions and builds on the, uh, the earlier anecdotes and it keeps offering more and more anecdotes while also cutting back in the present while going back and transporting itself to different points of time in the past and also looking forward in the future. 
right? So there's multiple temporalities uh, about the last bit in Ulysses is interesting, is what gives the novel, it, it brings the novel into a very uh, fitting conclusion, which is not really a conclusion at all. Uh, it's a very open-ended novel in that sense. Uh, it's obviously you know, something that Joyce does later with Finnegan's Wake, where the final uh, sentence goes back to the early sentence and that, that makes the novel cyclical in quality, Finnegan's Wake. But even at the end of Ulysses, we have this, uh, this experience of bliss with which a novel ends. And quite literally, I want to situate this uh, experience of bliss into uh, a more postmodern understanding of the text. So, for instance, if we talk about uh, the role of understanding of the text of bliss, uh, you know, as opposed to the text of pleasure. So, the text of pleasure and the text of bliss are two different categories uh, you know, that Rolabart talks about. And the text of bliss uh, is something that opens up into different kinds of interpretation. It opens up into plural possibilities. It is quite literally uh, a celebration of centerlessness. And the celebration of centerlessness is what we see at the end of Ulysses with this female voice, the female body uh, foregrounding its position, foregrounding its location, foregrounding its situatedness as a subject. And how the, that foregrounding comes with the sort of centerless quality which celebrates uh, the centerlessness with which the novel ends. So, in that embodied centerless visceral corporeal quality about the last stream of consciousness is what gives Ulysses such a radical uh, conclusion, which is not a conclusion at all. It opens up to a yes. And obviously, if you do a readerly reading of uh, this novel, which is also a rule about in way of looking at it, he differentiates from two kinds of texts, the writerly text and the readerly text. The readerly text obviously is a text which you can read and, and open up for further interpretations. So, the readerly reading of Ulysses, uh, it opens up, it ends with yes, which is also an invitation for opening, it is an invitation for acceptance, an invitation for further acceptance, which is go on forever, an endless series of acceptance, an endless acknowledgement. And that acknowledgement, that acceptance, that invitation to interpret, that gives Ulysses a more flowery feeling in the end. It just opens up uh, into this endless flowery um, readerly quality with which the novel literally ends. So, I just want to connect this uh, last bit uh, about Ulysses, uh, how this fluid, readily blissful quality at the end, which cuts back and, back and across time, uh, which foregrounds bodily functions, uh, some disgusting bodily functions, uh, some er erotic bodily functions, some pleasurable bodily functions, and how the body literally becomes a speaking, uh, the, the voice at the end of the novel, how the body foregrounds its voice and the bodily functions and the sounds of the bodily functions, they those become the voices at the end of Ulysses. So, that, that gives it a very heteroglossic, a very polyphonic quality and by polyphonic and heteroglossic I mean the many voices at the end of Ulysses, which has just keeps proliferating different kinds of voices uh, to the body, from the body and about the body. So, the body becomes very much foregrounded, it becomes a center stage, uh, the corporeality of the character becomes a center stage at the end of the novel, which produces different sounds, which produces different kind of images, which produces different kinds of experiences. And the experientiality of the body, it is grounded in the body, is what gives Ulysses, the final bit of Ulysses, this magnificently mutable, this magnificently messy quality with which a novel ends. And the messiness and the mutability of the novel gives it, a, give it a very, very human uh, condition. Now, uh, I just mentioned at the beginning of the novel, how this novel is this mag magnificent, uh, you know, you know, encyclopedia of time, will also be uh, quite literally and superficially just about one day in Dublin, it is about one calendar day. But you know, notice the way in which this calendar day in Dublin, it just cuts and backs across so many different points of time. And that is something which you see in a final uh, soliloquy as well. It is the end of the calendar day, it is uh, you know, Lupa Bloom and Molly Bloom going to sleep, the calendar day is coming to an end, uh, the historical day is coming to an end. Uh, but then what it, the ending also does, it opens up uh, the different orders of temporality, it goes back in time, it digs up things that happened in Gibraltar when Molly Bloom was a child, it cuts back in the present when she is having an affair with Hugh Boyland. Uh, and obviously, uh, it also brings up different kinds of uh, you know, different na reminiscences and anecdotes about how she was first proposed, how she was the first proposal of marriage is given to her. Uh, so, that obviously what that does is that it cuts this calendar day into different segments of time, in different slices of time, uh, which are very magnificently mutable and very magnificently mess messed up. 
and the messiness and mutability, as I just mentioned, is part of the corporeality. It's like the body cannot contain itself, the body cannot contain its functions, uh, the its excretory functions, its reproductive functions, its pleasurable functions, its blissful functions, its gastronomic functions, its nervous functions, all the functions of the body are put together. So, the text, the Ulysses, the text in a way quite literally becomes a human body, the organic human body. And that is the last bit I want to spend some time with, the organicity and immediacy in the novel. So, these are two qualities with which the novel ends, the organic city, the, the very organic quality, how the body becomes the speaking voice, how the body becomes the articulator, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, that is the organicity bit and the immediacy bit is obviously capturing the present, how the body inhabits the presence, how the only way you can inhabit the presence is through embodiment. So, what it does uh, is that it gives a, a very uh, corporeal quality to time. So, the only way you can contain time, the only way you can occupy time is through corporeality, is through your body, you can occupy time through your body. And that the point of occupation produces the images, produces the voices with which the novel ends. So, the final soliloquy of Molly Bloom can be seen as an act of corporeality on time. Uh, it is a corporeality mapped under temporality, so to speak. So, how the time becomes fleshed out in quality because the body occupies it. And you know, the soliloquy becomes uh, something which is generated out of the occupation, out of the inhabition of the body into time. So, temporality and corporeality are mingled together, they all become part of one fleshy network which produces its own narrative with which the novel ends. And this is obviously undercutting, as I mentioned at the very beginning, undercutting some of the dry intellectual discursive quality that novel deliberately parodies. So, we can see a constant parody over and over again of dry discourses about art, about intellect, about culture, about nationalism, about Christianity, etc., about history. Uh, and that is also all brush aside in the end and the final voice belongs to the woman, the final vo voice belongs to the body, the final voice belongs to the corporeality. So, th it becomes quite literally as I mentioned a celebration of centerlessness and a centerlessness is mapped onto the corporeality. The body cannot contain itself, the body cannot contain its center, it has an orgasmic quality about it which is also part of the blissful quality. So, the text becomes a text of bliss because the text assumes the body, the text assumes the corporeal quality which opens it up non-syntactically uh, to a complete release from punctuations uh, into this emancipated order of representation. The lack of punctuation, the absence of punctuation of course, is quite symbolic. It is part of the emancipation, it is part of the liberation uh, that is experienced through the body. So, the liberation, the emancipation, the lack of punctuation all these are done to a sense of uh, transcending the body. The act of transcendence of course, is not really a, a bodiless transcendence, it becomes a very embodied activity of transcendence. Transcendence can only be occupied through the body, can only be experienced through the body. And also look at the way in which uh, you know, despite the uh, slightly transcendental quality in terms of escaping from reality, it actually, actually brings us back to reality. So, a true escape of reality, a true experience of reality can only come through a living and true reality, right. So, it is not really a complete departure from reality at all. It becomes an, uh, a very a more complex engagement with reality, uh, a complex engagement which takes us back and across time. Uh, reality, temporality, corporeality, they all come together to give you a sense of you know, a very uh, visceral engagement with time, a very visceral engagement with the now, the present, uh, you know, and of course, this very famous line uh, in Ulysses, which happens some to some, somewhere in between the novel, in between, in the, in the middle of the novel, where you know, the character, the Stephen Dallas says, hold on to the now, uh, through which all the future plunges into the past. So, now is a capsule that you are holding, now is a capsule that you are sort of, you know, the, the only thing available to you, uh, so to speak, uh, as a human subject, as a, as a sentient subject. And the sentience of the subject is dependent on how you hold the now, to which all future plunges into the past. So, this plunging of future into the past becomes interesting and the body becomes a vehicle through which the flow of time takes place. So, quite literally at the end of Ulysses, we find Molly Bloom's body becomes a vehicle of temporality, which is also to say it becomes a vehicle of corporeality. The body becomes obviously is hypercorporealized in quality and the hypercorporeal quality obviously gives a sense of transcendence to the body. So, it talks about memory, it talks about remembering, it digs up things from the past and that bringing in all the memories from the past from Gibraltar, different kinds of political locations, different geopolitical locations all comes in together to create this messy magnificent mutability uh, with which the text assumes the status of a text of bliss with which a novel ends. So, you know that makes Ulysses obviously 
uh, not just a modernist work of literature, but also quite postmodernist in terms of its aspiration towards centerlessness, right? And that aspiration towards centerlessness, the desire for centerlessness, is a desire that can only occupy, that can only ha happen through the body. So the foregrounding of the body, the foregrounding of corporeality, is part of the aspiration towards centerlessness, with which the novel ends. And the language, uh, the the linguistic register, the linguistic landscape, in Ulysses quite quickly becomes centerless in quality at the end, where he moves away from uh, the tyrant tyranny of syntax, the tyranny of rationality, the tyranny of reason and instead it aspires for the bliss, it aspires for the experience of bliss, right. And the experience of bliss is which is, is quite literally mentioned at the end where you know Molly Bloom pulls Leopold Bloom through this reverie uh, in her body and then says yes and yes and yes. So again it is an affirmation of the body, it is an affirmation through the body and that affirmation also brings in an idea, an experience of liberation, an experience of uh, uh, emancipation, which is part of the centerlessness, which a novel ends up celebrating. So, on the one hand, we find uh, uh, you know uh, Ulysses being a very, very modernist. It's obviously one of the cult modernist texts. It's one of the high modernist texts, and everyone talks about Ulysses as being the modernist novel, the one new novel which cuts back across time, uh, which is full of epiphanies, which is full of streams of consciousness. But equally, it's a very, very interesting post-modernist text as well because it, the way it plays with temporality, the way it plays with syntax, the way it plays with language and the way it foregrounds the body uh, as part of the narrative technique that becomes a very, very postmodern thing. So, it is a very difficult novel to place in that sense. Stylistically, I consider it to be very, very postmodern quality. It is some of this bridge between modernism and postmodernism. And unlike uh, let us say the wasteland, unlike Mrs. Dalloway, the center lessness in Ulysses is not really mourned. There is no nostalgia for a more centered existence, uh, which is a very modernist kind of nostalgia. Instead, we have this uh, looking forward towards a center lessness, which becomes a desirable condition, it becomes a desirable uh, state of being, and the desirability of center lessness is what gives it, uh, at least sentimentally speaking or affectively speaking, a very postmodernist quality. So, my argument, my concluding argument about this novel is. The novel is situated historically obviously at the time of high modernism 1922, that is where one of the big novels, uh, the big works in novel, uh, modernism are being done the, the, the uh, second decade of 20th century, uh, 1925 is where um, uh, Mrs. Dalloway has been written, 1922 is also a year in which uh, the wasteland gets published uh, and Ulysses comes in the same time as well. So, historically it is a very, very modernist text, but stylistically it tends to anticipate much of postmodernism in terms of its linguistic technique, in terms of its semantic adventures and in terms of its semantic centerlessness so to speak and how the corporeality uh, it, it is very much foregrounded within a text. So, a text becomes quite literally you know uh, an embodied quality and embodied function. So, the end of the text and the end of the bodily sensation uh, of Molly Bloom are synchronous in quality, are simultaneous events. So, the ending of Ulysses and the ending of Molly Bloom's uh, quasi orgasmic reverie are synchronous events. And the synchronicity is interesting because that quite literally connects textuality and corporeality, and it maps textuality onto corporeality and corporeality into textuality. So, the body becomes the text, the text becomes the body, which obviously becomes a very, very postmodernist way of looking at gender as well. Those of you interested in postmodernism would know that people like Judy Butler, people like you know Julia Kristeva, uh, Louis Irigari, uh, Helen Kixu, so all the French novelists, the French feminists later, they talk about textualizing the body, textualizing the gender and obviously textualizing the gender entails a sense of centerlessness with which Ulysses the great novel ends. So, I hope you enjoyed reading Ulysses with me uh, and this is a phenomenal text obviously we have not done justice to it fully because we have done just the letter sections of it uh, for the purpose of expediency we could not do it uh, line by line which is something I would have done in an ideal world but it required an entire course just on Ulysses. It is one of the greatest achievements in the history of fiction, the history of literature in my mind uh, in human history uh, uh, not just in English language, not just in modernist times but also across history I think it is one of the greatest novels, perhaps the greatest novel ever written. Uh, it is definitely very, very experimental, it is definitely very, very aspirational, it is a very, very ambitious project and of course, uh, some of you would know uh, Joyce Fans such as myself, uh, you know uh, James Joyce has once asked uh, very sarcastically that you know what did you do in the first world war, uh, why did not you fight in the first world war to which he replied in a very Joyce way, well during the first world war 
I wrote Ulysses, what did you do, right? So obviously that becomes a, a very interesting statement because on the one hand we have this war collapsing everything, collapsing everything we know about culture, civilization, architecture, towns, cities, human relationships. On the other hand we have this novel as this fantastic recreation of human relationships, a fantastic recreation of the architecture of Dublin because as I mentioned in one of my earlier lectures in a novel that it is so so realistic in quality as well because if you I mean uh, if you take a walk across Dublin and there are lots of uh, Ulysses walks in Dublin uh, the point that the time taken to go from point A to point B which happens in the, in the novel is exactly the same time it will take you to go from point A to point B if you actually take a walk in real Dublin is that realistic in quality is that precise in quality in terms of realism and despite that in its fiercely modernist in quality it's fiercely experimental in quality and like I just mentioned it ends with this invitation and celebration of centerlessness which makes it one of the first postmodernist works in fiction as well. So, I stop at this point today, I conclude with Ulysses with this point with this lecture uh, and I hope you enjoyed reading it with me, do read it entirely if you can, it is a phenomenal treat to the human senses, to the human intellect and to the fiction loving imagination. So, with that we bring to an end to Ulysses by James Joyce and move forward with new texts in the subsequent lectures. Thank you for your attention.